Revolution. And I always try to come and speak a little to the people. Uh, for the best, we can pick up the offering. And all the money in our campaign has been a very strange thing. I've so I have to hear this, I can say this, that it's, that the gospel of Jesus Christ, this hasn't been a meal for me. If I thought that way about it, and that's the only opportunity I had, I'd go back home. Go back to this year. My job back at the state game board in Indiana and go to work. I preached 12 years back to Tabernacle of Jeffersonville, about one penny salary offerings in Indiana. I worked. If it was somewhere now that I could get it. Now, this seems very strange, but if I knew that while I was in Chicago, if I could get a job, nobody would me, so I'd get out there and sit myself on the street. That'd be what I'd have to do to take care of myself. Now, that's not just to be humble. That's from my heart. And I could relax myself more, but, see, but then in these kind of meetings, you can't do that. You've got to stay constantly with God. You know, just what will be the next move. Or remember me. And the larger services where we sit together, there's critics of everything. Satan's waiting for one false move. And right. everything that he can, he'll pin right on that. Right. So that I must be careful. Just think, friends, in the meetings that I've had, what if it wouldn't have been just exactly true? Look what has taken place. Many of you have read my book back there called Man Come From God. You see the testimony of the Lord. What would have happened in some of those false places where Critics, maniacs, and everything run right to the platform and say, Right this hour, I'll sway, I'll take measure of going your body. Well able to do it. Ministers shrink and run from it. And then the Almighty God can't go out and that person falls for it. Then it says, Psychology, you're reading the people's minds. Agents of different things, and most of the time, preachers. Run to the platform and say, Now that's psychology, you're only reading the people's minds. See the power of Almighty God and move down and move that thing back to his word. Sweet, thin, and wherever you go, the opposition is always there to Satan. That's the reason. Many people, you don't know how I like to come and visit with many of you. I long to do that. But in this case, now, I can't compare my life and tell you to live the way I do. I have to live the way he wants me to. Uh, either to be the servant of man or the servant of God. In order to be the servant of God, I must sustain, no matter how much I love, I must sustain from people. I'm not an isolation. You don't know in my heart how I love people. But I have to stay away from people in order to stay with God. No matter who the person is, even my own people. My own brother drove up here today and my wife said, not listen to I don't know where you're my brother now. And my brother is flesh. Said you haven't been in my house for years. My mother cries and says, Billy, why don't she visit me? But I ask my mother. But I love her. But for instance, the lady sitting in this church is asking, which is my wife. I promised God and her that all my affectionate love would go to her for that part of the woman. I promise that. Now, if I go down the street and a, a young lady comes along and says, Oh, you, uh, the well, I, I love you. Well, the first place, if I thought I loved, had love for the girl, it would be false. My first duty is the love that I place for my wife. I must think of that first. That's first. Then I'm, no matter how much I think here, I know it can't be right because this has to be right first. And if it's contrary to that, I'm going to take this first. That's what I promise God. And that's where there's the truth and the gospel and Christ and people. I love people with all my heart, but my first love is to Christ. My first duty is to Him. Therefore, I must serve Him. You understand, don't you? And these missionary offerings, I tried to sustain some money. Never took an offering in my life. Never took an offering in my life. I never one time. I tell her sometimes, my wife gets after me, so she just might as well get ready to get after me again today, or she'll sit there. Right after, we've been married about two years, 
your discretion and time far. Ah, we just couldn't make any of these. Did you ever read that to me? Yeah, we all have. I that. And I was getting about, all oh, about sixteen, eighteen dollars a week. The children to take care of and everything. Oh, my. What do I do? So I said, you know what? I'm going to take one off in this time. She said, well, I don't know more what to do. I said, I've never taken one. But she said, when we built a little church right in this time, 1932, and I borrowed the money to cut it up, and I never took an offering one time, a little box on the back of the church that in so much as you have done to these, these my little ones, you've done it to me. I never told the people it was there, but when the payment came due, it was there. That's the line of faith. Because God thought it was just one And then I remember that night I went over and it was taking an offering. Now, not all the people wouldn't give it to me. Sure, they died for me. But they, if it was necessary, they would, they would do it. But I didn't want it. I was young, worked, had a job, the rest of them is working. Why not I do it? So, it didn't interfere with me in my ministry. So I went ahead. So I remember that night. <laughs> I said, to her, well, friends, I said, <coughs> uh, kind of hate to say this, but I, I kind of get a snag. I, 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 I would take them off. I said, Brother Weinhardt, did you get my hat? We didn't have any questions. So, Will you take my hat? I said, yes, Brother Billy. He looked up at me kind of strange, went over and got my hat. I looked down, there's a little lady by the name of Ware, except I always said, a little old mother with one little check of aprons on. The pocket on the inside of the apron, you know, you know, the side, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you mothers, it's I seen her reach down, pull this little apron back, and get down one of these little pocketbooks that snaps on the top, you know. She undone this little pocketbook and began to fumble around with them nickels in there. My, I couldn't take that. <laughs> that would have haunted me the rest of my life. I took that poor old thing's money. I looked at her, a very big lump swelled up my throat. I said, now, friend, I was just trying to say that I didn't mean that. I said, I was just <laughs> My wife sat there looking to see how I was getting along. You know. There's an old man. He's usually had every one of these meetings around here. I don't know whether you sure or not. His name's John Ryan. Not the John Ryan that he was lying. It's another John Ryan. You'd think he belongs to the house of David. He wears long hair and long beard. And he, he's at the Hannah meeting and the Zion meeting. He may be here somewhere for all I know. He comes down to see me, so he rode a bicycle down. A bicycle probably cost him three dollars. It's a real one, you know. And here he comes down, that long hair blowing the beard on one side, coming down to see me. Well, I think it's backslid while he's down there. Now, that's a mouthful for a Baptist to say, isn't it? Backslid. But he, the bicycle did in and he set up and said, Brother Bill, you can just have that thing. And uh, he hit like that. So he gave me the bicycle, and I just went home and I said, I thought you were going to pick up that all. Now, that's money. I thought, well, I'm not really I went and got me a can of paint for about 15 cents, and I doctored up the old bicycle and painted it and sold it for $10. And I all the money I So, but, it just seemed, I couldn't take, I know that poor little old woman could drop in there and pay anything. Maybe she didn't stay in there or something else. Me, a young man, her 65 years old or something. I couldn't do that. So, we try to do the same way in our services is not to, Bum people for money. If ever one time I hear one of my managers begging for money, that's the end of the manager. We don't have no more management like that. Because when God wants to supply my needs out here, He wants me to go home. And so we and uh, wait for another vision. So um, I, I'm not very good at that, brother. Boy, see, I'm, I see I'm I'm probably too close to it. I remember the first one of those that I ever tried to talk to. I was scared to death. I never seen nothing like that. And I was at a Pentecostal meeting, and they just invited me to the platform. I didn't know how close, and I scared the thing, and I was looking at it and getting back, and, and it was over here around Mission Walk. Yes, uh, Bob or Harry, Harry probably Harry can adjust it so we get it right. Okay, Yes, all right. Now, yes, sir. It probably is because I sure don't know nothing about it. I, I'm sure of that. Uh, all right. Say, you know, money plays a big part after all, doesn't it, brother? <laughs> I was sure to get it done now. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, brother. That's very nice. Now, this afternoon, while we are here, 
Brother Baxter said, well now, Brother Brandon, for a missionary, now I couldn't, I could tell, if it had to come time for me to take up an offering for the Lord, I could do it, but I couldn't do it for myself. But if you're not long ago, there's a great sum of money, many of you heard about it, was given to me, and I refused to look at it. I could make all of you happy to take a move that amount of money, a million five hundred thousand dollars. I really refused to look at it. They packed an article up in the paper, but I, I didn't want it. It isn't money. A man who gets his mind on money, popularity, things like that, is sure losing out of the class. There's three things I've noticed in recent history that wrecks the minister's life when he starts. One of them is money, the love of it. The next is popularity, when he thinks it's something when he's nothing in it. And the next is women. So, man takes money, women, popularity. That's been the three major things that God had trouble with his children. Many other things that goes along with it too. But the main thing is when God begins to bless the brother and give him something a little more and, or something other to help his people, then the man begins to think, see who I am? And right then he's going to go down. You want me to tell you how to get up? Get down. The way up is go down. He that humbles himself, God will exalt. Is that right? He that exalts himself to be made of it. Now, to speak in the afternoon like this, I, I'm not a, a preacher. When I come behind Brother uh, Baxter, Scholar, Brother Jose, these other ministers sitting here who are men who are educated, and my little grammar school education don't go very far, I tell you. At Fort Wayne meeting, I never will forget it. I was out there just preaching away, you know, and I come back behind the curtain after service and go resting up at two weeks to walk out. And there's a fine scholar walked up to me and said, Brother Brandon, that's your grammar turtle. I said, yes, sir, I know that. I said, I just had a seventh grade education. My father died. I had to take care of him. Oh, that's no excuse. He said, my, I said, the mistake that you made tonight. That you should, you should have, uh, know better grammar than that. The crowd that you speak before said, "Why is this great?" I guess he was well, oh, Mr. Webster, you know. So I said, "Well, sir, I said I know that's right." I said, "But he said, well, you could take a, a correspondence for." I said, "Yes, sir, but you see, other times I said I was, I had to take care of a big family and everything, and now to make the ends meet." And I said, "And now." I said, the Lord's work is so, keeps me so busy. I said, I don't have time to, to take it. He said, oh, that's no excuse. He said, I heard you tonight out there saying, all you people that come by this pole pit tonight, believe it, we're getting healed. I said, yes, sir, what was wrong with that? I don't know this. Is. And he said, well, you should not say pole pit. He said, you should say pole pit. He said, those people appreciate you more if you said, look, they didn't me a little too hard, you know, so I put my hand over on the shoulder. I said, brother, I don't want you to hurt your feet. But then people out there don't care whether I say full bit or full bit. They want me to preach the gospel and produce what I'm talking about. They see Jesus Christ. That's all they care about. So now, I, that's the reason I don't say I'm a minister, uh, a preacher. When I was a little boy, my father was a, a rider, and he used to follow rodeos and so forth, and ride fancy riding. He had a good shot with pistols, and I used to see him take high roll cans, just take those little bitty cans like that, and throw them out like that, and take two guns, and just keep rolling that can. Well, I couldn't hit a large can like that with a rifle, so it, it what a difference was. And a rider, well, he could just, I'd see him ride with a blood of blood, his nose and ears, and I thought, well, my, that's... He, when I got to be a good-sized boy, I said, I'm going to be like my dad. So we had an old plow horse there. I just lived in Indiana. Most of it's not. We had an old plow horse there. He was about 14 years old. And I plowed the old thing all day. We had an old watering trough cut out of a, a log. Did you ever see one of them when you cut the old log? Look at the country folks here, would you? My, that's fine. Well, I'll take off my, my coat and my tie now. <laughs> so... That, that old water and salt down where it had to pump the water, you know, one of the kids had to put a pump in a half hour almost before the time was up to get enough water to water the heart. So we get behind the barn so Dad could sit and I took him and get his saddle, you know, and throw it across the old horse after we watered it full of harness off the gear. And then I'd reach get me a handful of cuckoo birds and stick them under the saddle, you know, and pull down the girth. 
climb up in the middle of this old horse with this straw hat, you know, and a poor old horse so old and stiff and tired, he couldn't get his feet off the ground. He just bawled, you know, just down there bawled. And I'd take my hat in my hand and I'd holler and scream, and my brothers all sitting around on this boat. All of them sitting there, I was a cowboy. My, I really could ride. That poor old horse was like, like riding a rocky horse out here. It wouldn't be as bad. So when I got to be about 18, I thought, well, I'm old enough. Now I'm going out west and be a cowboy. Probably seen him in a movie. And so I went out west and I landed in Arizona just as time in the rodeo. Well, I went down and had a little money and I'd go buy a pair of shacks. So they had to find a nice big pair, you know, and I put it on me like that just a lad, anyhow, you know. There's about 18 inches of leather laying out on the ground when I got. Look like one of these little band of chickens, you know, them feathers down behind me like that. I thought, well, they're too big here in Arizona for us Kentucky. So I, I got my pair of Levi's and went out, climbed up around the trail fence where he's riding the horses at the rodeo. And I heard him say, now the next is going to be the Kansas outlaw. It's going to be rolled to so-and-so and tear it all like at the car all the time. I looked alongside that fence there all all these figured cowboys, you know, setting up there, weather beating, you know. Look all along, I thought, that's where I belong, up there with them guy. So I climbed down and get up there and sat on this grill fence with his Levi's on, a hat and both ears hanging down. <laughs> Too good for me. So it only cost five dollars and five cents, so it wasn't very much. You know. But I thought I was a real guy. Well, so I rode that old plow horse, you know, and I thought, I can do that too. I never seen a real outlaw road, you know. So after a while, they run this horse right into the sheep like that, the bull came. And when I came out, this fellow was standing there, checked his can as he dropped out in the saddle, as he dirted the saddle on, I heard that horse squealing and bawling and kicking out for a fall. That ain't that old plow horse that I had at home. When he jumped out of there, this fellow jumped right in the saddle and made just about two side wheels like that, and then a the sunfish in the saddle, man and all, <laughs> went out and when he hit the ground, the pickups got the horse, and the ambulance got the man, the blood was running out of his nose and ears and everything. Here come the caller by, said, I'll give any man Fifty dollars who will ride in thirty seconds. Well, I come more riding out here. I said, all right, all them cowboys sitting on the fence. Said, I'll give any man fifty dollars who will ride in thirty seconds. That would be like offering two thousand today. All that fifty dollars sound awful big. He looked right at me. Said, Are you a rider? I said, No, sir. <laughs> that was the old foul. And that's the reason now when I talk about now when I'm home around the church. Say, you preacher? Yep. But I get out around these preachers like this, say, you preacher? I said, no, sir. <laughs> but I do love the word of the Lord. And I love to worship him in his word. And we have fellowship around the word of the Lord. Now, a few little texts that usually I use out like this at home. I go into the Bible, teach the Old Testament, the New, and so forth. Not in the line of Greek and Hebrew, because you don't know it. But just the way I see it here. And the way the Holy Spirit will reveal it. But that's the news. If the Lord willing, I'd like to take a little text here. Maybe I, some of you here might have heard me preach on it. I preach on four or five different little subjects around over the country, something like that. A uh, come and see a man. I usually use that sometimes. That's uh, the woman at the well. And you usually try to approach it in a different manner so that each time it'll be different. A little text like that because I don't want to get too far off on that side or when I go back tonight to shake back to the service, it's a different anointing. It upsets me sometimes. So... Or, uh, uh, believe it thou this, or, or, four ways of seeing God, or then he cried, or little things like that. So, at that noon, I want to read out of St. John, the, the, of the, uh, even now, Lord. I want to read out of St. John 11th chapter. And the reading of the Word, God will produce the result by the reading of the Word. Do you believe that? I have spoke on this somewhere before, maybe in the neighborhood somewhere here, somewhere across the country. If I haven't, we'll try to approach it in a different way for the sake of those. And now Brother Baxter's one does the preaching. I just come down and kind of relax with me a little this afternoon and for tonight. The 11th chapter of St. John, and let's begin about the 18th or 19th, 18th verse of faith. And read just a little portion here of the scripture. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brethren. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. 
Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother would not die. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask God, God will give it to you. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall be lived. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which is coming into the world. Now let's bow our heads just for a moment and speak to the author of this book. Lord Jesus, Master of life, giver of all good gifts of thy grace, we know that we are saved not because of our merits, but because the grace of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. At one time we were aliens, cut off from God, Gentiles, worshiping dumb idols. But in due season, Christ died the innocent or the guilty, taking us to the Father. And now we are sons and daughters of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be like, but we know we shall have a body like his, or we shall see him as he is. Lord, how we groan in these bodies to be clothed upon with immortality, to be clothed upon with his spirit, that someday we know this, that in the old heaven, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. It only covered sin. And uh, living just waiting in paradise for the day that sin should be taken away. But when Jesus came, the Son of God, the Messiah, he took away sin. He divorced it. Never covered it. He took it away. Then, now, since then, if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one waiting glory. We go straight to the presence of the Father. There to be clothed in immortality. Oh, if this earthly pattern, if it should be taken away this afternoon, born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world seeking my sinners by nature. Then God has redeemed us, redeemed our soul, and it has a blessed body waiting for us that will never be sick. Even above temptation, a body like his own glorious body, and we shall see as he is. Now, Father, we're approaching your word. There is no man who was able to open the book or to loose the seal thereof. But the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, he was worthy, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him and opened the book and loosed the seal. And now, may the Holy Spirit come and get on these words that we just read. May he speak today and go right out over this audience here. And may the Holy Spirit give to the church just what we have in the house. Faith, prepare a service for tonight, Lord. May tonight be the greatest service, not because of us here, but because that thou art here. May it be the greatest service that this Philadelphia church has had since it's been established. May there be a shaking go forth tonight that will have the holy God of heaven to send us back there in a big stadium and auditorium somewhere that will shake Chicago for a three or four minutes. Grand Lord, do the exceedingly abundantly today. Prepare the hearts just now. Break up the ground. Grub out all the green briars and the stickers and the thorns and the roots of bitterness and bring down the Holy Spirit so the night that the angel of God might sleep over this building in a great meeting while we ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you, brother. To the approach to the Word, now just for a few moments, I'm going to take my watch off. I don't know where the clock is, but then, and I'll try to stay no longer than I'm talking to So that you have ample time to get ready. And my son, just a few moments ago, asked me to announce to the people that want prayer cards for tonight to be here at 6 o'clock tonight, if possible, to receive prayer cards, those who are afflicted and in need, and to be here at 6 o'clock tonight to receive the prayer cards. Now, our scripture goes back to days just before the 
or this time, was in the ministry of our Lord. He has just become very famous because of God being with him. He was a man, not no beauty we should desire him. He was he wasn't much to look upon, probably a little frail looking fellow. And the Bible said that he was not beautiful in the way he's a big six footer like or seven footer like Saul, but he was a small man. The Bible said we hid as it were our face from him, yet we did a steamy, smitten, smitten, stricken, afflicted of God. But the works that God was doing in him was outstanding that the people knew that he come from God. Or even the great teacher said, it came to him by night, Nicodemus by name, and said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, because no man could do these things that you do unless God was with him. They know beyond a shadow of doubt. Now, the ministers of them days said, now he's a psychiatrist. He's a, he's a mind reader. He reads their mind. That's how he knows what's wrong with them people. He reads their mind. He did. And Jesus was a mind reader. That shocks you, didn't it? But he was. He perceived their thoughts. Is that right? Or was mind reading? See, not one of these sitting out here, one of these little women sitting out on the corner taking the palm in your hand. That's the substitute the devil's got, something to imitate it. That's the bogus dollar to the real dollar. See, everything God has done, the devil's made a substitute for it, made something bogus. See, and that's the reason the two spirits in the last days come right along with these farmers and fundamental, they miss the spirit altogether, you see, like that. And some of these on the radical side go come off into isms with it. But right in the middle of the road runs the true church of God, singing and full of the power of God. That's what's at. Now, certainly, everything that God has, Satan has something to counter to it. He makes something off of it. And Jesus did perceive the thought, so therefore the great orthodox of those days said, that guy is the best fortune teller in the country. He's Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. Is that right? That's what the preachers say. And the great Bible teachers of that day said he is Beelzebub. Now let's see what the devil said. The devil said he's the son of God. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Is that right? And that state, the devil's had more knowledge of God than the ministry did. Is that right? When Paul and Silas was up there and they was doing some great works for God, this little old fortune teller run out down the street every day and cried behind Paul and said, There's the man that tell us the way of life. That's the man of God. And here was a preacher said, They're imposters. They turn the world upside down. They're no good. And uh, there was the ministry saying, They're imposters. And the devil saying, They're a man of God. Which was right. <laughs> the devil was right. Is that right? Sure he was. So you see... Even damn people, you can get so much on the Word, you think, oh, the Word, the Word. That's right. But the Gospel came not the Word only, but through power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit until the Word is made life. See? We saw right in your hand, but you never get a crop out of it. You got to bury it and let it take on new life. Is that right? Now, the Word is right. This is God's way, of course, but this the Word letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. See what I mean? Now, and therefore, the enemy had to testify of God. In his ministry, here he went forth, and uh, things began to happen, and then the churches all froze down on him and said, Now, if anybody goes over there to hear him, we'll just get your, and your papers in. You'll have to go out, you know, no more. But there's some people by the name of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, uh, brothers and sisters, and they heard Jesus and they seen his miracles, so they didn't care whether he was what the orthodox said, what the church said, or nothing about it. They believed him, and they went with him. And they believed him because they knew he was a man of God. So he came to stay in their house at, at Bethany. And now, when he was living there with, with them, his ministry got so great that one day he had to go away from the home. It crowded him out. Too, much, too many people around the place, he, the people had come to him to the thousands and he would slip off away from them and go off somewhere else. He would be alone with the Father to pray. The city would call for him, but he would go up in the mountain alone and see which way the Father was. He came to do the work of the Father. That's what we ought to be about today, our Father's business. That's right. Not so much in the social ranks and, 
and so forth, but in the Father's business. Now, let's take this wonderful Jesus just a minute and watch his coming just before he came. There was a, first before his coming, there was an announcement. The church had all got all back and all messed up just about like it is today. And one having this is Pharisees, Sadducees, publicans array, all, all kinds of isms around. And that's even some man come up and claim he was a great one and read hundreds out in the wilderness and they perished. You know the story. And all like that. But to finally come the time for he to come, he's a remnant who is waiting for him. And one day, let's watch. I see an old man and a woman way past the age of bearing the woman was. And she said... They had prayed for God all these years to take away her reproach and she could bear children as it was an honor for any Hebrew woman to have a child. How they changed that now. It's almost an honor, dishonor to have a child. Now, isn't that right? You might not say amen, but it's the truth. A woman had rather pay $100 for a little old smashing old dog and give it a mother's love out here than to fool with the baby. Now, you know that's the truth. Walk it down the street with a little sweater on it and I've seen one of the biggest clinics i ever seen early out here was a dog clinic. I don't see it. <laughs> I can't see it. All right, anyhow, that's up between you and God. Now, look, then Zachariah was a righteous man, a priest, and he come to the house of God and his, his office was in there to burn incense while the people were praying. And then one day while he was burning incense, the time of the promise was drawing nigh. And God sent an angel down to the altar. Do you believe in angels? Yes, sir. Someone said not long ago, said, Brother Branham, you're mistaken about that man that talks to you. He said, that was the Lord. I said, it was an angel. He said, I am sent from the presence of God. He wasn't the Lord. He was an angel. Also, that's all mistaken, said Brother Branham. God in old times in the Bible spoke, said there was Daniel and all of them. Yeah, they were had angels and so forth like that, but not New Testament doctrine. And this man was a man who said, we speak where the Bible speaks and silent where the Bible silent. I thought how silent he was on many things at the Bible spoke. I said, do you mean to tell me that you don't believe that the angels of God meant to no, sir? The Holy Spirit leads the church. I said, that's correctly. But they have ministry spirit sent in the presence of God. He said, not in the New Testament, brother. I said, oh, yes, in the New Testament. He said, the Holy Spirit, not angels, the Holy Spirit. I said, look, I want to ask you something. I said, it was the angel of God who met Mary. He said, yeah, but that was before Pentecost. After Pentecost, he said, it was the Holy Spirit from then on. I said, truly, the Holy Spirit leads the church. That's true. But look, I said, do you believe that Philip had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe it? All of it? Sure he did. Well, when he was down in Samaria holding a revival, who was it that spoke to him and said, go out to the desert, Gaza? Was it the Holy Spirit? No, sir. An angel of the Lord spoke to him. Is that right? Go out to the desert, Gaza, and speak. Look, how many believe that, uh, that uh, Peter had the Holy Spirit? Let's see. You believe he had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When he was in prison that night and down at John Mark's house was having a prayer meeting for him, who was it like a light that shined in the window and opened the doors for him? Was it the Holy Spirit? The angel of the Lord. How many believe Paul had the Holy Ghost? Or when he was out there on the ship 14 days and nights, no moon, stars, and all hope was gone, he went down in the gallery to pray and he come back out and said, Have a good courage. For the angel of God, whose servant I am, stood by me last night, said, Fear not, Paul. Is that right? The angel of the Lord. The whole book of Revelations was wrote by the witness of an angel. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify these things to write into the church. Is that right? John fell down to worship the angel. The angel said, Do it not. I, not Joseph Smith, but he said, A true angel won't stand to be worshipped. You know that. No, sir. He said, Worship God. And God still has angels. And they visit the people, not a worship of angels, but angelic beings who are attributes of God sent forth to minister to the church, to the people. Oh, my, how short we are of the real apostolic church today. We people who claim to be there, who claim to have kissed the blessings of the rims of the cup of blessings, how short we come, how we bubble dance on top of the suds and know not what the bottom is. That's true. Now, friends, when I stand back here, I'm responsible not to the audience, but to God. Amen. That's right. 
And my words must be. I know I've got many millions of people that listen and watch every word you say, so I must be with all my heart just as true to God as I can be. And I say today that we've never scratched the surface. That's right. The church ought to get down. My. We, it's, reading, it's like reading and writing and arithmetic. Notice. Now, this angel came. He was Gabriel. Now, God sends minor angels. That's right. Perhaps the one comes here. Some people will actually puff their mind up with angels and things who they think they've seen and things like that. That's just the counterfeit. If a man has seen an angel of God and that, God has commission, uh, that angel commissioned him from God and it was sent from God, it'll bear record right down through the line that it's the truth. Do you believe that? But if it doesn't, it isn't the truth. That's one thing you can depend on. By their fruits you shall know them. That's true. Now, notice this. That this uh, angel was Gabriel. Now, these minor angels come, but when you see or hear of Gabriel coming, you get ready for something major fixing to happen. Gabriel was the one who announced the first coming of Jesus Christ. Is that right? Amen. And we're taught in the Bible that Gabriel will announce the second coming. He'll sound the trumpet of God. Is that right? The coming of the Lord. The angel of God, Gabriel, who stands at God's right hand. Now, this great Gabriel come down, and here was the priest uh, swinging his uh, incense here, burning it while the people was out praying. He was standing at the altar, and he looked over on the altar, side of the altar, and there stood the great archangel. It frightened the priest. And he told him all about his life and things and what he was going to do. He said, after the days of your ministration here, go home to Elizabeth, your wife, and she's going to bear a child, and you'll call his name John. Why, well, look, that priest now said, how can these things be? She's old. See, there's righteous people walking in all the light of the Lord. That's the kind of a home that God can get into. Now, if you're serving all kinds of, of parties and beer and everything in your house, God will never visit you there. That's right. But if you've got a home that's cleaned up and living for God and prayer and a Bible open and a few tear stains on it, God can visit you. That's right. Because you've opened up a channel that he can come to. And there's where it was. Now, when God had answered the prayer of Zachariah and Elizabeth, it like to scare him to death, of course. He didn't think that it could happen. But he said, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and my word shall be fulfilled in their season. And then he came back out, and the people, he was stricken dumb. And he was going to be dumb until the day the baby was born. And then out comes Zachariah, and the people, he beckoned to the people, and they seen, he had seen a vision or something. So he went home, and Elizabeth conceived and hid herself uh, six months, and she was to be a mother. Then watch just down in Nazareth, the meanest city in the country, worse than Chicago probably. Then, for nurse that is Jeffersonville, where I come from. Then the first thing you know, well, there a little virgin one day engaged to a man about 45 years old, widow with about four children. While she was coming home in the old rental type, probably is on a Monday, she's packing her wash water on top of her head, maybe in a jar as they do it, walking along, and all at once before her flashed a big light. She frightened the little virgin. She looked, and there was a Gabriel standing by her side. Said, Hail Mary, or stop. Said, Blessed art thou among women. Said, told her how that her cousin Elizabeth had conceived in her old age and was going to bear a child and said uh, that she was going to have a child knowing no man. Now look at the difference between Zechariah, that minister who had studied the scriptures over and over and over and over and over and over again, had plenty of examples. There was Sarah and Hannah and so forth back in the Old Testament. Plenty of examples. He, he doubted it to be so. But this little girl didn't doubt. She said, Behold, the hands made of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. What a difference. Now, sometimes you can callous yourself reading the Bible and just like reading a newspaper and having about the same kind of faith that you'd have in one, then you callous yourself. When you read God's word, believe it just like it says it is there and take God at his word. Now, as soon as she read this, or she's seen this before her, and the angel Lord said, you're going to have a baby. Look what she had to believe. Well, she had to believe something that had never happened. Zachariah didn't have to believe. Plenty of times that it happened through the scriptures. He had plenty of examples. But Mary had to believe something that was total impossible, and it never happened before. But yet she didn't stagger at it. She just said, behold, the hands made of the Lord. 
be it unto me. She took God at his word. And today, right here now, while hundreds of people around the world has been healed in these great campaigns and this latter revival that's sweeping the world, right today, right at this minute, dozens and scores of people in meetings here in the United States are being healed right now by the power of God. Plenty of examples. Every day, every night. And yet we sit and wonder, God, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? Take God at his word. Mary said, Behold, thy hands made of the Lord. She started to rejoice and she was happy. God had promised it. She knew she was going to have the baby. I believe I spoke something about it last night. She didn't wait till she felt right. She didn't wait till she was positive. She didn't wait till any visible sign. She just believed what the angel said was the truth. There you are. The trouble of it is we question God. And if we question God, we can't believe God. Faith is the substance of things hope for, the evidence of things you don't see, taste, feel, smell, or hear. Amen. I begin to feel a little religious right now. <laughs> All right. Oh, take God at his word. She began to rejoice and praise God just as soon as she heard. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Is that right? Faith cometh by hearing. As soon as you hear the word of God, it says you can be set free. Believe it. Rejoice with it. God will show the evidence after you've accepted it. That first you accept it. Christ died for sinners. I believe it. I accept it. I start rejoicing. God works righteousness by it. I believe he is striped for my healing. I believe it. I accept it. God works healing for me. See? Just as soon as I believe. He can't help me till I believe. I've got to believe and confess it first, and then God's under obligation to his word. And if he's almighty God, he can do all things. And if he cannot do all things, he's not almighty God. There he is. All right. Notice what kind of a boy ought this to be. What kind of a person. God keeping his word. God promised to do anything. God will do it. When the children of Israel was led out of Egypt, God promised to take care of them as they journeyed through the wilderness. God said he would take care of them, and he did do it. No matter where the path led, any enemy got in God's path, it'd give away. I can see him come up to the Red Sea. God had his mouth drawn out. Where he's going to take them? They will move out to the Red Sea. No way at all across it. There was Pharaoh's army. The mountains on one side. Pharaoh's army here. The Red Sea in front of them. Moses lifted up his hand. Psalm 72 said, God looked down. He seen that path laying through the bottom of the sea. There was his children right there meeting the promise, taking God at his word. God looked down through that pillar of fire and with angered eyes. And when he did, the sea, he got scared and moved back like that and made a dry path and Israel walked through on dry ground. Take God at his word. When they crossed the Red Sea, them uncircumcised, those people pretending to be like the make-believer today, trying to do so, perished. Then a great victory come when they seen the object side perished. Miriam got in the spirit, grabbed up a tambourine and went out on the bank, dancing. Kind of shocking, isn't it? Dancing, beating a tambourine. And the daughters of Israel followed her, beating tambourines and dancing in the spirit. That ain't an old-fashioned revival I don't know nothing about. Victory! There laid the dead ones laying in the back, the ones, all the things that have bothered them. When that old sickness that bothers you, that old stomach trouble, oh my! When that old pipe, that old seeing them things that set you back and held you back, when you walk through the blood of Jesus, Hunter, and God has cleansed your soul, there will be another dancing party take place. The joy of bells of heaven will leap up in your heart. There was a leader, Moses, got so excited. Yeah. <laughs> he threw his hands up in the air and sung a song in the spirit. Sounds like camp meeting time, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Now, they'd come away from all their crops. They'd come away from everything they had. A little basket of kneaded bread on top of their head. They packed out was eaten. No bread. Nothing to eat. God had promised. 
I'm not excited. I know where I am. Let me tell you something, brother. What the church needs today is not a new mayor of the city or a new Democrat, a new Republican party. It needs an old-fashioned, God-sent, Holy Ghost revival. And the Bible only goes back into the church again. That's what it needs. How marvelous. Yes, sir. When they were thirsty, they smoked the rock. They drank from the will, from the rock. When they were needy, God supplied need. When the Christ was ready to come to the earth, God made arrangements. Now, look at little Mary. Here she takes off up into the wilderness, up into the mountains to see Elizabeth, her cousin. Jesus and John were half, were second cousins. Mary and Elizabeth were first cousins. And they went up into the mountains, she did, to enjoy the fellowship of her cousins. That's what we need to do today. This, the deadest thing in the world is a dead sea who takes everything in and gives nothing out. If we come to a meeting, God fills our soul with glory. We ought to tell 50 people a day, everywhere. Every day, tell another 50, another 50. Give out. That keeps the system cleaned out. <laughs> All right. Notice. Then up into the mountains they went. And I can see her as she begins to approach. I see the woman run out. She's sitting there. Let's dramatize this a little. I can see her sitting there a knitting, you know, or crocheting, or what the women were doing them days. She seen Mary coming. She threw down her crocheting or knitting. Up she went real quick, grabbed her up in her arms, throwed her arms around her, and kissed her, and said, Oh, Mary, I'm so happy to see you. Love one for the other. That's all gone about now. Hey, is that the truth? All gone. What a day you don't even know your neighbor's dead until you read it in the paper. Isn't that right? I remember when we used to be able to borrow money and everything from the farm, the other farmer. Now you try to do it. <laughs> you have to have some security. It's a shame. Love. That's what the world's dying for today is love. They don't need to be so orthodox in your teaching. Some fellow, maybe it wouldn't be two of us in here agree upon the same thing, but we can't agree this, that the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Let's have love one for another. Jesus said, this will all men know that you're my disciples when you have love one for the other. Now, here not long ago, I was down in Florida. I just want to pass this. Mr. Bosworth, many of you know him, old daddy Bosworth, F.F. F. Bosworth. Helped great meetings here years ago to some of you old mothers and dads remember him in Chicago. And when we were down there, he just when he first came into my meeting, we was having, I went down there for the little kid was holding a meeting. He had, he said he was just about to go under. So when I had a meeting, and that night a duchess come up. I think that's what she called him. One of these women, you know, at the highest society. And so Brother Bowser said, Brother Branham, uh, uh, this duchess that owns this all this property out here wants to see you. I said, well, I can't now. And so when we passed through the tent that night, back in the little prayer room, here she was standing there. Oh, brother. <laughs> Underdressed and overpainted, you know. Two great big earrings hanging down, look like skirts to the devil, you know, the saddle set right between your neck, riding right down. And there she sat there and she had a pair of glasses out. She held, I'm not making fun of the woman, but not enough clothes on to want a good musket shotgun. And there she stood out there with these glasses on a stick like this, you know, holding out like that. She said, are you Dr. Branham? I said, no, ma'am. She said, I said, I'm Brother Branham. She said, well, I'm so charmed to meet you. Well, I didn't know what the woman was talking about. I reached up, got a hold of that big old hat, fat hand there. There's about 40 rings going to look at me like. I got. I said, get it down here. It's all over when I see you again. Yeah. Putting on a lot of dough. What was she? Six foot of dirt right down her. That's right. Oh, that's the way it is today. How can you expect anything more? When people just bathe their souls in all kinds of corruption and pain. Birds of feathers flock together. You know some of the most beautiful outside birds there is are scavengers. <laughs> that's right. Or so don't notice the outside, it's the inside that counts. That's right. All right. There, Mary ran out and met a... Uh, a Mary went to meet Elizabeth, and she hugged her, and she said, Oh, my, I'm so happy to know that you're to have the child. She said, Yes, I'm to have the baby. That's true. She said, You know, 
the Lord appeared to me also. See, she had a blessing to, to explain. So the Lord has appeared to me and told me that I was going to have a baby knowing no man. And I would call his name Jesus. And little John, as far as we know, had never received life. Elizabeth said she was scared. It was six months with her then, his baby, with the baby, and no life. That's subnormal. That's altogether subnormal, about two or three months. And here it was, six months, no life. And just as soon as Mary spoke the name Jesus, little John received life and began to leap in his mother's womb for joy. If the first time the name of Jesus Christ spoke to mortal lips, brought life to a dead baby, what ought it to do to a born-again church? Hallelujah! What ought it to do to a sick person? That name Jesus brought a dead baby to life. And the Bible said that John received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, or he received the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb, and was born full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! There you are. Receive joy and begin leaping and jumping, and the Holy Ghost come up on his mother, and she prophesied. Oh, my. Talk about short of the kingdom of God. Yes, sir. Then, Mary returns back after staying with her many days. Look at little old John when he was born. What manner of child should this be? Well, I guess we'll have to send him off to the seminary, cemetery, <laughs> whatever you want. It's both a dead place. <laughs> A seminary preacher puts me in the mind of an incubator chicken. A little incubator chicken turned out mechanically. The little fellow just chirps, chirps for a man and he ain't got any to go to. That's just exactly like an incubator preacher. He's got reading, writing, and arithmetic, knows how to stand so popular and bow his head and holler arm on him like a dying cat and knows more about God than a hot pot knows about a Egyptian knife. That's right! You know it's the truth. You might not say amen to it, but it's the truth. That's right. Well, I don't care if my boy don't even know his ABCs. I want him to know Christ is full of part of sin and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We don't know split beans from coffee. That don't make any difference to me as long as he knows Christ in the forgiveness of sin. Look at this little fellow at nine years old. Tuck out into the wilderness, not to some seminary to have some embalming fluid pumped into him. No, sir. He went out into the wilderness. There he lived with God until he was 30 years old. You know the birth of Jesus. We're running short of time, so I won't take time to rehearse that. You know it. But at 30 years old, what kind of a preacher ought this to be? Here he comes out of the wilderness, not with his collar turned around the back, a tuxedo coat on, eating fried chicken and biscuits every day for dinner. No, sir. Hallelujah. He come out of the wilderness in old Perry, hairy trousers on, a sheepskin belt wrapped around him like that, but he preached repentance. I can see Herod come up, you know, living with his brother Philip's wife. I hear some of the elders come out and say, don't preach on marriage and divorce today now. There's Herod sitting out there, old John full of the Holy Ghost. Could you imagine him holding him back? Walked right straight up in his face and said, it's not lawful for you to have her. Amen. That's right. God give us some Johns. Well, I say today, what the Baptist church needs the more Johns like John the Baptist. Who will not compromise, but will preach the Unreachable, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Brother, he didn't have no education. I never know he had a day of schooling. He never had no degree of any kind, no bachelor or bachelor's degree or whatever you want to call it. D D D D or what you want to call it. You know what D D stands for? Dead dog. All right. He had nothing but that. But he told him where they live and what to do. God give us some more badness like that. Exactly right. It is not lawful for you to have her. True. Some fellow the other day I was talking about some lady uh, recording a story about some lady up playing the piano. And now you can, now this is your own business, that's up to you. See? But the lady, she had on so much makeup, that woman had enough paint on to paint a barn, almost. And uh, he said, this man said, Brother Bram, this is my wife, said she's a saint. I said, brother, don't want to hurt your feelings. She looks like a hand. She don't look like no saint to me. That's what I You know what a hand is down the south? That's a spook. <laughs> All right. Let me tell you. Listen. The only woman in the Bible that ever painted her face to meet a man with Jezebel is God fed her to the dogs. So if you say these people are supposed to be so good and got the Holy Ghost, you say, how do you miss dog meat? That's what God calls her. It's dog meat for me, you see. 
It's all right. Let me tell you what we need today is preachers with Take the gloves off and stand in the pulpit and claim the full gospel of Jesus Christ with the power and in the face of the Holy Ghost. Get the people you kept shaking in a little bit this way and compromise a little bit this way. That's just exactly the way the Lutheran's done. That's the way the Methodist's done. That's the way the Baptist's done. And that's the way the Pentecost is doing. Amen. You go right in the after this. But it don't, let me tell you something. It's the main thing I'm responsible before God. Amen. That's right. I mean, I believe that to be the solemn truth of God. Yes, sir. The only thing you have to do is get that heart right. Now, we all live here in these Middle, East, Middle Eastern states. we got an oak tree out here. Every year, all through the winter, the old oak tree packs its leaves just the same. Spring of the year, there's the old leaf on the tree. You don't have to go pick them off. Just let the new life come up, the old leaf goes off. When a man's really born again in a... His heart, woman or man, the old life drops away, the new life comes in and takes its place. Just, just let them get right with God, then you can notice by the fruits you shall know. And let me tell you, my friend, I better shut up right here. <laughs> That's right. I remember in my life story, the first little date that I had to go out, I had a little old girl out, I thought, you know, you had your first girlfriend. Oh, she had eyes like a dove and a neck like a swan and feet like pearl. I thought she was the prettiest thing I ever seen. And we went out, we, a boyfriend and I, we got some Cokes and some sandwich. I'd come out to give some sandwich to my little girl, and she was eating the sandwich, and we drank the Cokes, and I'd go run the bottles back in. When I come back out, that's just the days when women begin to lose their grace, you know. And so here she was smoking a cigarette. I looked at her. I always had my opinion of a woman who smoked a cigarette, and I still have today. It's the lowest thing she ever done. Don't let your face get there. Don't get up and walk out when you're guilty. All right. But let me tell you something. If God thinks, if he thinks about the way the angel of God witnesses me here right this afternoon in the platform, you'll have a hard time getting the gates under. I tell you, when you come up before him, for quit, stop, lay aside these things. The hour of judgment is at hand. And if the Virgin Mary had to go in down there in the upper room and carry so she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and come out staggering like a drunk woman, you'll never get to heaven anything cheaper than that. That's right. Women, man, listen to that. I'm telling you the truth. Get God down in here. He'll take care of the rest of it. Now, then just look around. You don't have to see it. Well, I got it. The fruit sure it's not. So that's just, don't say it. Just go ahead. You know where you're at. All right. Now, look. Then I seen John, when he came out there and began to preach my life, just with repentance as hard as he could preach, laying the axe at the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth forth my good fruit, you and down cast into the sea. And then notice, or into the fire, rather, then along came Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway out of the water, and the voice of God spoke to this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, into the wilderness he went to be tempted of the devil. Every man and woman that says you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, Immediately the devil sent in from every side. If he didn't, then you better go back. Then every time when you get healed, here comes symptoms moving right around you again. If it didn't, be careful. See, Satan's always there to beset what God has done. Then his ministry got great and away he went. Out into the... Then he comes to our text. Quickly now. Then we see Lazarus, he went away from the home. And as soon as Jesus left the home, sickness set in. Sorrow set in. Listen, Christian, when Jesus leaves your home, sickness and trouble will set right in behind you. When he leaves your home, get ready for trouble, because it's on its road right there. You welcome him to your house. Let him be the unseen guest. Sit down at the table. Never eat without thanking him, Paul. I see many people call themselves Christians and never return thanks. This is illiterate as a hog under an apple tree. A uh, hog can sit in an apple tree and the apples are beating on the head all day long. He'll eat till he can't grow up no more, Harry, but he'll never look up to see where they're coming from. That's right. That's exactly the truth. People are just so unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, peace breakers, false accusers, and the fierce and despisers of those that are good. Trade your heavy, high minded. Love is a pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power that has from such turn away. That's what the Spirit said in Timothy. Is that right? Yeah. And here we are living into the day. And Pentecost gets a lot of it. You know, these people going out of it. It's headlong. That's true. Oh, my. What a sad sight it is. What we need today, brother, is a revival, a stirring, a breaking down, breaking up. 
going to the potter's house again. Watch. I see Jesus now go away from the home. That's a tough stick. Now, this is history. We told him he had hemorrhages of his lungs. I don't know. That's not the Bible. That's just a historian writing. They had hemorrhages. Well, Jesus went away from the home. Then Martha and Mary and all of them had left the synagogue and was following Jesus. They sent for Jesus to come pray for Lazarus. You think he done it? He walked out on the way. Now, if that had been you, <laughs> you said to your pastor and he couldn't have come, you said, by the old hypocrite, I'll never go back to the Philadelphia church again. I'll never go back no more. He didn't come. But if Mary would have thought that, Martha, what a day it would have been. Now, he never asked me to say that. <laughs> I just said that. That's the answer. You've got to have faith in your pastor as a man of God. Be it and it isn't. Did he not get somebody in there? That's right. Don't stop the church. That's right. Go on. If he is a man of God, he doesn't live and do and act and preach what he should, take him out. But somebody else in that will do it. Right. Now, now, then you've got to have confidence. This is the house of judgment, the house of God, where God comes down and passes his judgment. Your pastor is supposed to be a righteous man. The congregation is supposed to be with him. 100 percent, you're supposed to be just 100 percent together. And in there, if you're not, then Satan's got a way to get in. you got a loophole somewhere. So have everything cleared out. Then when they sent again for Jesus. Instead of doing that, he just went on. Never come and said a word about it. He had a vision from the Father. I'll pick that up there tonight if I can. He had a vision from the Father. Then Lazarus was going to die, and he had to follow his vision. Of course he did. He went on. After a while, they said, he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps well, the disciples, they said, well, if he's asleep, he's doing very well, and he's recovering, he's getting better. Then he let them know in their own language. He said, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. But I go with him. He knew where he was going. God already told him. He followed what the Father said. He know what man told him, what God said. He knows just what to do. I can hear someone say, hey, that holy roller was around here preaching divine healing. Ah, oh, when his buddy got sick around here, he says, that's too much of a job for him. Did he slip away? Now we see about that. All right. Then he said, I'll go with you. Now the first day passed. Grievous things. They come in and got Lazarus, took him, bombed his body, take him out, and buried him in the grave. All hopes was gone. The second day passed. Still dark. Third day passed. Corruption set in his body. The fourth day he had done gone. Then the first thing you know, somebody come that little Martha and Mary sitting in the home crying. The breadwinner was gone. All the left, look what was gone. They'd give up their church. Now the man that they had their confidence in seemingly had betrayed them. All hope was gone. Their brother was dead. They turned out of the church. This man that was teaching divine meaning and their, their pastor right, he was gone. All hopes, everything was gone. About that time, Jesus come along. That's usually when he comes. Just in the darkest of hours. It was the darkest of hours when Jesus came on. I was laying down in the hospital. The doctor walked in, looked at me. He said, my boy, you have three minutes more to live. Your heart's beating 17 times in a minute. Darkest hour. Then Jesus come along. Yes. Is he hard table down here in Indianapolis, laying out there on the street, drunk? Flies go in his mouth. He staggered into the church where he had backslid, and the Democrats made a big rally hall out of it and went down into the basement. Drunk, staggered over the coal pile, and there lady's mother's picture that had prayed the darkest hour he'd ever seen. Drunk, drunk, cast out. Then Jesus come along. Yes. Yeah. Johnny, when my old brothers told me I had a short time to live, Jesus come along. It's always the darkest of hours, then he comes along. He's always there just at the time, the right time. Jesus came along. Now, little old Martha, she'd been very dilatory about things, but I, about the kingdom of God and so forth, but I admire courage. As soon as she heard Jesus come here, she went to the order she could go. I knew him saying, I look at her going. Uh, he goes out there, they say that holy roller's coming back. She just brushed him aside. She wanted to get to Jesus. Martha had been reading over there in the Bible somewhere. One time there was a Shunammite woman who did a great favor for a prophet. She knew he was a prophet. His name was Elijah. And Elijah blessed her and told her she was going to have a baby at a certain day, at a certain time. And that baby was born when she passed the age of Aaron. And she brought the baby. The little baby must have got a sunstroke or something. He said, my head, my head. He got in the field with his father about 11 o'clock today. 
He sent a servant in, put the baby on the mother's lap, and the baby lay there for the meantime and died. Look at that Shunammite woman. How painful. She tucked the baby right up to the little chamber where Elijah had been sleeping. She made him a place there where he could sleep when he come by. What a good place to take him, up to the prophet's bed where the prophet sat. She laid him down on the, on the bed. She went on to a servant, and she said, Saddle him last night and go forward and don't stop. Oh, my. Let's have business. Said, let's go to the Mount Carmel to where that prophet sat. And her husband said, it's either new moon or Sabbath. He won't be there. She said, everything's all right. Let me go. I like that determination. I like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise our God. Hebrews, so don't, don't get worried about it. All right. She started off. She said, don't you slack up. You drive. Now, drive with you just as hard as he can go. When she got close to Mount Carmel, she knew one thing, that God had given her that baby and the closest representative on earth she knew that was Elijah, his prophet. She didn't know why God took the baby, but she knew if she could get in contact with that prophet because God was in the prophet. And if I could get to that prophet, I'll find out why my baby did. He was the one that told me it would come, and I know that's God's prophet. And if I can only get to him, I may have to drive hard, and I may have to drive a long way. But if I can get to the prophet, he can tell me why this baby is gone. So here's to the prophet. God don't always tell his prophets everything's going on. So Elijah walked out to the door, and Gehazi was with him, and he said, There comes that shoot of mine. He said, She looks weary. Something's wrong. He said, God kept it from me. I don't know what's the matter. So he said, When he seen her coming, she got up close. He said, Is all well with thee? Is all well with thy husband? Is all well with the baby? Listen to this. All is well. Hey! Brother, you ain't already got enough room up here to preach right now. Let me tell you something. All is well. Why? The baby a cart. Her husband wringing his hands and walking the floor and her heart close. All is well. <laughs> her faith was that she could get to the prophet. That's all she needed to do. I found you, Elijah. You are God's representative. God is in his prophet, and I've come here now. I'm satisfied that God will reveal it. All is well. You have to fell down to his feet. Yeah, he's about here. You're supposed to keep people with you, Master. Shirts her up. So let her alone. So her heart breathes, and I don't know what it's all about. Then she began to reveal to him what had happened. Now watch. He said, Gehazi, take my staff, and you go forward. Go to the baby. If somebody speaks to you, don't speak back. Somebody salutes you, don't salute them. Somebody says hello, don't say nothing to them. Go straight. That's what's the matter today. When we got a message, we stop for social affairs, for dinners and parties and everything like that. And we'll sit and so and talk about it, so and so. No wonder we can't get nowhere. A man has got God's message. Let's go forward. Right. But take my staff. Elijah touched that staff. Elijah knew that anything he touched was blessed. Why do we lay hands on the sick? Why do we ordain the elders by laying hands on them? Elijah knew what he touched was blessed. I think that's where Paul got taken handkerchiefs from his body. See? Paul told that whatever he touched was blessed. If the people don't agree with it, they to they get the same blessing. Just the same as he prayed for them or laid hands on them or whatever it was. And Elijah knew that that staff would be blessed. He said, Gehazi, Put my staff in your hand, hold it before you, and go forward now, and don't check for nothing. Anybody speak to you, don't speak. you got a commission now. Go take this staff. That was all right. The handkerchief was all right. But that Shunammite woman, she didn't know whether God was in the staff or not, but she knew God was in the prophet. <laughs> she said, as the, he said, go on with her now. She said, as the Lord liveth and your soul liveth, I'm not leaving you. Oh, there you are. I'm going to stay right here, right by your side. you got me on your hands now until we know about this. He said, go on with it. No. And the guy, he said, went ahead. So he girded up his loins and started off with her. Here they go. The woman with the prophet. Her heart's desire. Going on down. Elijah said, I don't know. He ain't told me nothing about it. I can't tell you. I'll go down there then. Here comes the hate back. He said, did you lay the staff on him? Yes. Was any sign? No life. He's still asleep. He's still dead. He's gone. See, the woman's faith wasn't in that. It was in the prophet. 
She knew that, well, she didn't believe that God was with the staff and done the same thing. But she knew God was in his prophet. So here's one Elisha. They're all the neighbors together at the door, and they were weeping and screaming and mourning and carrying on like that. Old Elisha walked into a bunch like that. Walked in, pulled the door together, shut the door. There laid the little cart. Many, many hours had been dead. Probably the way of late evening, Elisha walks up and down the room. Oh, my. Hallelujah! Walking up and down the room. Walks over. He knew God was in him. He laid his body on the baby. Put his lips against his foot, his nose against his nose, his forehead against his forehead. He held his body there. Not prayer. Put his body. He laid there. That's why he felt his flesh was getting warm. Got up. Walked again. Oh, my! Up and down the floor. To and fro. A howling outside and screaming and carrying on like you're walking. Walked back again. Throwed his body across the baby, and the baby seized seven times. Picked him up! The call is human eye now. There you are. And uh, no doubt Martha had been reading that. She knowed if God was in his prophet, surely he was in his son. <laughs> Hallelujah! My brother said, but let me get to the Son of God. Amen. I have consolation when I get there. She runs out of Now look, looks like she could have braided him. Looks like she could have sparred him. Said, why didn't you come to my brother? Why didn't you come when we called you? We give up everything to follow you. We left the church. We lost all of our prestige in the city. We've done everything. And when we sent for you to come to pray for your own bosom, you refused to do it. She thought she had a right to do it. If she would have done that, the story would have never been written. It's your attitude towards it. Your attitude towards God's divine gift will purchase just what you ask for. Do you understand? Oh, how I'd like to stop my hair, brother, go and punch that for about a half hour. But I can't do it. Your attitude. God can send a gift, and no matter what you, it depends on what attitude you take towards it. Look at them who slowly his face and spit on him and everything. There's no virtue there, but a woman that breathed was touched to him and he's gone and was healed. Is that right? All right. Depends on what you think about it. God says that it's your attitude towards any divine gift determines what you get out of it. So there, she knew him. She ran right up to him. Look at her. I love this. She ran right up this young, beautiful Jewish uh, maiden, fell down to his feet. She said, Love. That's what he was. There's his title. I believe you're the Lord. Lord. If thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. Look at that. All the darkness, all the doubts, all the fears, everything that passed away, she was to Jesus there. She knew if, he, if God was in his prophet, God was in his son. And that was God's representative thing. Is that right? God has one major representative on earth at time. He had one Elijah. And as soon as Elijah was taken, then Elisha comes. See, only one major representative. You know who his major representative is today? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's his representative. Now, if you can get to him and say, you can feel him, bless you, uh-oh, something's going to happen. There you are. So you can feel his feeling, touch one thing in your body, and a faith confirmed there. Yes, I believe it. Something's going to take place. She fell down at Jesus' feet. She said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, just as the Shunammite was to the prophet, so was Mary to the Son of God. She recognized him to be the Son of God. That's what he was. She recognized him as the Lord. That's what he was. No matter what the other things was, he was the Son of God. She said, if thou would have been here, if she could only find favor with him now, she would get what she asked. That's the reason the Shunammite woman was finding favor with Elijah. See, she knew that was God's representative there. And if she could just find favor with him, that, that, that took the case right there. That would be settled. Now, if I can just find favor with Jesus, that settles the case. Now, this afternoon, if we can just find favor with the Holy Ghost, that settles the case. That does it right there. It's God's representative. You don't want the world to see me anymore. Yet, you see me. I'll be with you, even in you. Find favor with him and watch him call you to the audience tonight of your sickness and whatever it is. Find favor with him and watch the same take place in the church tonight. Or even not tonight, but right now. Right now. Oh, she got to him, and she said, If I would have been here, my brother not died. But look, my brother's dead out in the Lord. He's been dead four days. Skin worms is crawling in and out of his body. Corruption. 
awful smell was set in. He said he'd think about it in the grave. If you'd have been there, he would not die. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will do it. She had a little feeling down here something's going to happen. Don't you believe that? Even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will do it. Oh, how I wish that God had ever cancer-ridden person you ever want heart trouble, ever want of any kind of disease. Maybe you've searched through every doctor's office in Chicago nearly. Maybe you've been to every clinic. You've been everywhere, whatever it is. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will do it. Even now. You say, Brother Dan, the doctor said I couldn't live for just a little while longer. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will do it. Prayer changes things. Is that right? They say, Brother Dan, I can't walk. They told me I'd never walk no more. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will do it. Yeah, yeah. Look. Then something's got to happen. See, I look at Jesus. He said, Thy brother shall rise again. Oh, my. She said, Yeah, Lord. He was a good boy, a good, fine Jewish boy. He was a good man. He never done wrong. He's done all the things he believes in and so forth. I know he'll raise up the gentle resurrection. Look at him. The Bible says, No beauty we should desire. You old frail, stooped, overlooking fellow. He straightened his little self up and said, I'm the resurrection life. Hallelujah! He is now! <laughs> I am the resurrection life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Leave us out of this. She said, Yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God which should come into the world. Something's got to happen. Get God on your mind now. Get settled down. Here you are. She was at the prophet of all prophets. That the Shunammite woman stood by a prophet which was born here, mortal flesh and so forth. A prophet Elijah and knew by his signs and wonders and his prediction that he was a prophet. And the Shunammite woman got what she asked for. So could Mary. She come to him. She called him Lord. She knew who he was. She said, I believe that thou art the Son of God that could come into the world. There's a confessor, there's a believer with an impossibility in her heart for him to do, but she's recognizing God's gift. She's recognizing God's man, his son. She's right at the spot. Every one of them cogs are moving right in like that to its right place. Something has to take place. I believe, though, he's dead. He's rotten out there in the grave. He's been dead for four days. I hold nothing against nothing. I don't even think about it no more. You are the Son of God that when you come into the world, I believe whatever you ask God, God's going to do it. Oh, my. But I am the resurrection life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe us, I do. She said, Yes, Lord. Where have you been? Here he goes. Oh, four days before a funeral procession, a few little Jews, brokenhearted, crying. Jesus cried as he went out to the grave. Is that right? Here not long ago, a fine reader out of a certain church come to me and she said, Brother Branham, you put too much bragging on Jesus. I said, brag too much on him? I can't say enough about him. She said, oh, he was just a man. He was a philosopher. I said, he was God. Who he was. She said, Oh, no, he wasn't divine, Brother Branham. Said, He wasn't divine. I said, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. She said, Oh, in a manner of his love and so forth, he was God. I said, No, he was Jehovah. People are trying to push him around, saying he's just a good man, an ordinary man. He was the divine one. God manifested in the flesh. Seen of angels, preached on, received up to the heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Certainly, he was God. He was more than a man. He was a God man. He was a man in flesh, but he was God in spirit. That's what he was. God coming down to suffer temptation and martyrdom him to take sins upon himself and his path on the human race, bearing our sins himself. She said, I can prove you by the Bible if you just open up your mind that he was only a man. I said, do it by the Bible and I'll believe it. She said, when he went down to that re resurrection of Lazarus, 
sat on his road down there, he cried with the rest of the people. The Bible said Jesus wept, and that proved that he was a martyr. Look, I said he might have cried. That's true. On his road down to meet Lazarus, he was human as far as human is concerned. In his flesh, he was human, but in his spirit, he was God. I said he cried. That was a man crying. He was a man when he was crying, going down to Lazarus' grave. But when he stood there, straightened that little frame up and said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man had been dead four days. Come to life again. That was more than a man. That was God speaking to you there. Hallelujah. God was in his son. That was God speaking to you more than flesh. Corruption knew its master. Do you saw this? He was a man. When he got down that mountain that night, come down and looked all around that little fig tree there, and he was nothing to eat. He was hungry. He was a man when he was hungry. But when he took five biscuits and two pieces and fed 5,000 people, that was more than a man. That was God in the man. Hallelujah. He was a man when he laid on his back of that little boat that night. When 10,000 devils of the sea swore they were drowning, the little storm come up in the little boat, pitching like a bottle stopper out there on that lake. Like that devil said, we'll drown him tonight. He was so tired, virtue had gone out of him all day from preaching and healing. So he was so tired, the storm didn't wake him up. But when the disciples woke him, he was a man laying there sleeping. When he put his foot up on the rail of the boat and said, Peace, be still. Brother, that was more than a man. That was God speaking to his son. Hallelujah. Yes, it was. Believe us, thou of this. He was a man. When he cried up there at Calvary, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He died like a man, but on Easter morning, he rose, breaking the seals of death, corruption, rising to ascend to the Father above, showing that he was more than a man. He was God in flesh. Leave us thou this. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Believe us thou this. A woman with an infirmity of her flesh, with a blood issue for many years, touched the hem of his garment, and her blood issue stanched, stopped immediately. Believe us thou this? Jairus' yeah. daughter was dead, and I could see him cross the river, coming up there. He said, I'll go up and pray for her. And here come a messenger said, your daughter's already dead. Don't trouble the master. Little Jairus' heart began to fail. Those dark eyes of Jesus looked around and said, Thou not say, fear not, thou shalt see the glory of God. He walked into that death chamber where those people in there, and he said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. Or they said, that fanatic around here, he said, put him out. When he put him out of the room, walked over, and he was possessed with the power of the Holy Ghost that could speak in another language, and all these earthly things are failing, and he spoke in another language out here, and said, the that his daughter arise. And from the spirit land, where a girl had been laying dead and bomb laying on a top, he spoke a word into spirit land, and the girl that was dead stood on her feet and lived again. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Believe us out this? He's here today. Believe us out this? About seven years ago, we'll stand in Greenville, Indiana. I've got the trouble and bothered by visions and things and a supernatural power speaking out of bushes and ministers telling me it was the devil. Not that I had nothing to do with it. One night there, a light flashed across the floor and a man come walking to me with his arms folded said, I am sent from the presence of Almighty God to tell you that you're to pray for sick people. All these things will happen, you know, the secrets of the hearts and so forth. And if you'll get the people to believe you and be sincere when you pray, nothing shall stand before your prayer. Believe us, thou this. I believe he's here right now. I believe that the feeling is moving through the church right now. Like a milky way coming over the building. I believe that's the same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost. Believe us, thou this. I believe that in your heart that's a moving just about to make these explode out there. I believe that's the Holy Ghost trying to get in the soul to you. Believe us all this. I believe he'll heal every person here right now. Believe us all this. Just raise your hands and give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we are over heaven to earth. We thank thee for thy goodness. Oh God, we believe that you're here. 
sweetly that you're making ready a people. Oh, come, Lord Jesus. Heal this group of people. Feel the Holy Ghost to you. Oh, God. Go out the rush of mighty wind. Up and down these aisles. Touch with your eyes. We are your faith in Jesus Christ's name. Hallelujah, hallelujah.